Welcome. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm uh, the Executive Vice President and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. And we're trying out a new format today to welcome a great uh, global development and health leader, uh, Asif Saleh, who's, from, who's the leader of BRAC, uh, one of the largest and I think most famous development non-governmental organizations okay. in the world. <laughs> um, I wanted to kick us off with a little context. You know, these days, a lot of bilateral funders are talking about the importance of country-led development, of setting objectives and planning activities based on what is actually happening on the ground because the organizations that are there in country are the ones that will be there tomorrow. So let's take a look. How, how well have we done sort of cumulatively up to this point? And we'll just look at the example of USAID because I'm waiting for a colleague to, who's with us here today to uh, do a paper that looks at the t entirety of aid. But um, my colleague Justin Sandifer has put together what this looks like for the US Agency for International Development just to put the, these ideas about localization in context. Okay. So can I bring up the slide? OK. So this first slide shows the top 10 USAID recipients, US versus local organizations. And the top panel is showing us um, the top US aid recipients between 2010 and 2022, I believe. 20, I can't see that. <laughs> you can put it back here. To 2020. OK, so you can see that these are mainly US-based contractors, starting with places like Comonix, FHI, et cetera. On the bottom panel, we can see the top 10 recipients by country. That's South Africa at the top. Uh, but you can see that even the largest, uh, the country that has the largest allocations to local organizations is still really in the mid zone of USAID recipients in the US. And this is, of course, cumulative. If we look at a recent year, 2020, next slide. So uh, here, Justin has put contractors on the left side and grantees on the right side. The big blue slices, I believe, are US-based organizations. So you can see most contracts are really all in the US. On the right-hand side, we can see you know, more of the government-to-government -government stuff. I think that's in yellow. Um, but that little red slice, which is 7% of total, is local organizations and grants. And of course, grants are the minority of the money that goes out for USAID. So I just want to put that in context, because what you've achieved, BRAC, as a, as a non-governmental organization, in Bangladesh, but now in the world, right. has really been spectacular. And I think we'd like to see more organizations like BRAC and a bigger share of funding going to organizations like BRAC. Right. But, so let's just get started. Tell us a little bit about BRAC, how, how it got to where it is today. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I uh, really appreciate CGD taking the time to do this. Uh, but uh, I mean, right now, if you look at BRAC, it didn't start thinking around that it's going to be one of the largest organizations in the world. Mm -hmm. It started with solving a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think essentially uh, the problem was that people in Bangladesh who were after the war coming back, how do they sort of rebuild their lives? And, and it's like many other innovation stack because we were very much solution focused one thing led to another. So you start with the relief, then you see that very soon people talk about livelihood. Mm -hmm. Then you look, start to look at slightly longer term li livelihood challenges. What gets people into poverty and what keeps them there intergenerationally? Then there comes education, there comes uh, nutrition, health issues. So essentially over time we started looking at that poverty is not a, just an income poverty. It's it's about it's a very much more multidimensional and multifaceted uh, approach is needed to tackle poverty, and and uh, so the essential approach of back has always been the how do you uh, tackle it in a way which is integrated, holistic, and uh, create an ecosystem, whatever it takes to solve that problem around livelihood. So when 
Um, over uh, when you start first starting talking about livelihood, you talked about uh, we brought in microfinance, financial inclusion, but then very soon we saw that everybody in the village starting to buy a lot of cows, and where are they going to sell their milk? Mm -hmm. So then that led to kind of created the linkage to the market in the urban market where the shortage of milk was mm -hmm. there. So then Bragg Dairy was created, but then over time there's. Uh, milk producers actually had additional sources of uh, selling their milk, which were a better price. So many of these interventions were like this. And over time, one thing that was very much at the part of Bragg DNA was that in a resource constrained countries like Bangladesh, you cannot just work in a very small scale. You know, government didn't have a lot of capacity at that time. So you had to think big mm -hmm. and, and uh, you have to think like an entrepreneur. Uh, so scale was very, very important. Uh, so, so essentially, whatever solution that we kind of model we created, scale was always on the back of the mind. Can we keep it cost effective? Can we keep it very simple? Can we embed the communities in uh, sort of intervention in a way that when BRAC is not there, their capacity is built and they continue to uh, work on that impact? Um, so then over time, I mean, BRAC has, because of that, over expanded and then, uh, in many folds. So now we have very large scale programs in microfinance, to health, to education, to um, water and sanitation. Now, for the last five years, we are doing a lot of work in the humanitarian sector with the largest refugee camp in Bangladesh, uh, in the world, actually, the Rohingya refugee camp. Uh, then we have uh, 10 large scale social enterprises, which kind of created with this market linkages. Um, then we, has, uh, we have made some investments. We started focusing on SMEs. So we created a bank to support the SME, bank, uh, SME businesses. So um, now, uh, if you look at the organization as a whole in Bangladesh, and then I'll talk about a little bit of international, is that we have almost close to 100,000 staff. We look broader BRAC family with all our investments. Uh, almost 150,000 staff work for the organization. And there are touching uh, 110 million people in any any possible services, right? Mm -hmm. So, and and that's I mean almost every single individual in Bangladesh have some BRAC touch points. So, mm -hmm. so that's I think that's quite unique and powerful. At one point, we ran 64,000 schools in Bangladesh when there was very little public schools. Uh, so that has been scaled down because more and more uh, schools have been built by the public. So that's also a way to kind of also we are seeing an exit strategy for NGOs like us that mm -hmm. once a problem gets fixed you you scale down and exit out and you focus on newer challenges mm -hmm. whether it's climate adaptation right now urban poverty uh, youth unemployment these are the new frontiers quality of education I think these are the areas we are trying to focus going forward about 20 years ago we said that okay so here's the Bangladesh model here's our approach does this work outside Bangladesh, or is Bangladesh is a unique thing? So we took the model to Afghanistan. Same thing, after the war, rebuilding, and, and people were focusing on livelihood. Then over time, we went into some of the other post-conflict countries. We were, uh, so, so right now, again, our goal is not to spread across the world with mm -hmm. many country footprint. Our philosophy of development is much more that it has to be deep, it has to be long term. It has to be driven by the lo locals, mm -hmm. by the nationals. Uh, so BRAC in Uganda, BRAC in Afghanistan is going to be very much by driven by Afghan priorities. Afghan contextualization has to be needed in terms of the solutions that we come up with. Mm -hmm. So that's what you see that in, in, the, in the way the schools that we run has similar ethos that it cannot be road based learning. It has to be play with uh, learning with play and fun. Uh, but it looks quite different in terms of its approach in Afghan context when we run the girls' schools compared to Bangladesh, keeping the culture culture in mind. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I've That's, kind of sparked uh, yeah, it. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> yeah. there to unpack. Let's let's talk for a second about. Can you talk about sort of your learning process a lot that goes alongside the investments that you've made? Because of course, you know, microfinance, father of microfinance, of course, is Bangladeshi and Grameen Bank right. and all of that. But on the other hand, there's sort of mixed evidence on whether this was really the constraint to unlock women's well-being and things like that. Um, but also, BRAC has really been focused on evidence in at least in the past couple of years. Can you right. tell us a little bit about how that works in terms of your new investments, the testing, and learning from that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, testing research um, basically to 
ask that fundamental question, is it working, right? So, so when we start an intervention, that pilot phase, uh, that a bit is kind of, is, is very much human-centered, focused on the problem. But then we go into a scale for, we call it perfect, as in like, so iteration mode. Mm -hmm. So that is essentially where the linkage with the researchers come in. So asking that fundamental question that, is it working? Mm -hmm. Is it working? And if not, then tweak the model. Uh, before it scales up, so you need to be very sure that what are the elements of it is working, where, where do you need to keep your costs low. So essentially, that is a very, very integral part of how we do things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for example, you talked about microfinance, and, 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 and some of these learnings actually come from also a strong insight into because we are directly working on the ground rather than working with partners uh, like many other Western NGOs, right? So yeah. we have that implementation sort of insight. So when we were doing microfinance, we saw that there was across the uh, um, um, sort of various areas, a group of people who were taking microfinance loans but not being able to pay back mm -hmm. or their lives were not changing. Mm -hmm. So we commissioned the research across just to understand who, which group is this mm -hmm. uh, and what is going on with this group. And, and then it got validated that across the country, there obviously there's this group of people who are so poor so invisible, so disconnected from the system that just giving a loan does not change their fortune, mm -hmm. right? You know, the, so there needs to be a lot of additional hand-holding that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So therein came the whole genesis of this ultra-poor exactly. initiative, right? So, and, and, what, and, and we have an asset transfer element mm -hmm. there, but um, that is actually, I, I say, that uh, is the least important part, even though a lot of people think this is the most important part. It is an important part, but I think the more important part is the agency building. So there's that one person, our program officer, first going to the individual's house and telling them, telling her, the woman, that you can do this, you can do this, just try. And, and how you can do this, in the, how, you know, we'll help, help support you in training, support you to work with the asset so that you can think long term, support you to save, uh, look at sanitation. So looking at that whole multidimensionality of the, of the poverty, nature of the poverty, linking the rural elites with the families so that they're visible again. So one of the first things when the families um, sort of graduate out of ultra poverty, they say that uh, I notice uh, the difference because I started to getting invitations and weddings in the village and mm. so that elevation of the social status. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those softer parts are so critical and important in the design phase. So, so again, those designs all, also were came out of a lot of rigor that happened and where researchers were involved in this. And and of course, you know that you know we did a longitudinal study after yeah. nine years with LSE. Then Obajit and Ashtar mm -hmm. did a study in terms of the replication of the model in six countries and, and, and showed that it actually worked. So then the model took off. And uh, now it's been replicated in 46 countries. And thanks to that, uh, those research evidence mm -hmm. that was generated. Uh, so, so I think there are many models like that. But I think the core element is that obviously there are fundamental elements in the design aspect. But then you contextualize whether, what sort of asset you're giving what sort of uh, sort of activities, uh, but but the agency building is a big part of that. And the long term engagement with these communities, the Absolutely. ability to adjust course over time. Absolutely, it's, it's such an interesting story. Yeah. Let me um, ask you. You mentioned your work in Afghanistan and and uh, with Rohingya communities in Bangladesh, and um, you know, as as we've been seeing, there's a lot more emphasis on humanitarian aid over the past years. It's rising as a share of total aid. How do you see that development and humanitarian nexus? You're doing both kinds yeah. of work. I've heard from some NGOs, including <clears throat> some of them that are on the list in the top 10, mm. that there's sort of a broader pivot to humanitarian assistance. What do you think about that? How does it all fit together? I mean, that's one of the new realities that there are more crises mm. uh, around the world, man-made crises, a nature-made crises, and, and with the climate change, coming in with full force, some of these countries are going to see a lot more frequency now. So, so 
I mean, BRAC being a development organization, I mean, even in the last two years, uh, I've, I've taken over as the chief executive over three years, mm -hmm. but I have been doing a lot of firefighting because of when we're moving from one crisis, of course, we're dealing with pandemic. Mm -hmm. Then the same year, there was a super cyclone that came in, the longest flood happened. And, and this is all happening on the backdrop of this Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. which is like all engulfing um, uh, with the largest refugee camp. So, so, and it's been five years now as well. So there's no end in sight. Mm -hmm. The approach in the camps where BRAC is the largest operator working with other UN organizations is becoming more and more development-like. So you talk, you, you really look and, and basically focus on the women, get them out. Uh, you know, you look at education, early childhood development, very much just within the backdrop of humanitarian mm -hmm. context. Now, but the nature of humanitarian response is fundamentally very different from development response. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way the funding mechanism works is fundamentally different. Uh, we have been talking about localization. I'm, I'm very glad that you showed that graph, I mean, that in general, but humanitarian is, I mean, people signed the grand bargain, uh, mm -hmm. right? So that 25% uh, of the money is gonna go to local organization. What is happening in Bangladesh, right? I mean, that's, we know, the last five years, I, I got a firsthand peek on that. I mean, even though we are working with other organizations, but there are also a lot of other smaller players mm -hmm. than BRAC who are struggling, who are doing the work. But when you ask the donors, they say they are too risky. We can't fund them. So, but then when you ask the NGOs that why are you not building your capacity, they're like, I have to work in 2%, 3% of where I can, I barely can pay the cost. Mm -hmm. Where am I gonna fund? So, so this chicken and egg situation over there, right? So, so this is the localization story. And I've heard that everywhere. I was in Dubai in Rewired uh, in December. There are organizations who were like, I hear so much money is being splashed around. Everybody's promising this. And this young man from Beirut, he was basically saying that, but I'm running community schools. Nobody's supporting me. I see the need. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think fundamentally there, there needs to be a reflection that we are spending a lot of money both in humanitarian and development in general. Mm -hmm. Is that, how, how well is that spent? I mean, is that really building long-term capacity? Mm -hmm. I think essentially we, we feel, as I was saying, that you know, it, it, it really, I think the end of the day, the response and the capacity and the solution has to come from locally. Um, I, I think BRAC is an anomaly that, you know, an organization that started in Bangladesh is now going global. But there are other organizations that are emerging, like Pratham in India. Mm -hmm. uh, there are really good models which are out mm -hmm. there. And now they're starting to take that uh, elsewhere, contextualizing it. So it's really important um, that we actually harness these uh, and fund these, and on the, I mean, this is also the other side of the humanitarian crisis, mm -hmm. is the funding has diverted so much into that, that space, and also organizations like us who are not really doing a lot of advocacy work, because, and we're not doing retail fundraising, we have been in the past very much heavily dependent on bilateral governments, mm -hmm. and, and that's where the money is shifting. Last year, UK government from 30 million pounds a year it dropped down to zero just zero. overnight, right? So, brutal. So did you have any advance notice? We Transition actually, period? after the contract ran out in April, we heard in the end of May that this is gonna happen. No transition period, nothing, right? So, so this is also, I mean, the way it was done, and I've given an interview in The Guardian about this, but, but, uh, but that's, I think, uh, the other side of uh, looking into it. And I think, you know, essentially, one uh, reflection on an evidence generation of what's working, what is cost effective, what is scalable, mm -hmm. uh, or as opposed to what is just a project driven short term intervention, what is versus long term capacity building and really sort of changing uh, the face of poverty in, in general. That's that's the conversation we need to have. And, and there are some models. It's not that we need a lot of new innovations out there when mm -hmm. people I, I sometimes I talk to high net worth individuals who are philanthropists and they're like, okay, what is the new innovation? You know, we, we have done this. I mean, we don't need a lot of new innovation. We have sense. already, <laughs> we already innovation. have some answers. We have evidence. Let's scale them. Yeah. 
right? I mean, let's scale them in different contexts, and, and, and I think that's very important. Yeah, the, the basics still matter, as uh, many of my colleagues point out in, in their work. Can I ask you about um, some solutions on localization or this idea of mm. transferring more funding to entities that are nationally based rather than um, international contractors and things like that? So things people have talked about are you know, shared services platforms that would enable these organizations to meet the kind of back office needs to be able to report and process money from the US government or um, you know, uh, sub having a pooled, a, a bigger NGO or an international NGO do on granting. Can you reflect on, you know, in BRAC's development, actually other kinds of money made a big difference, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, you I think in, in a conversation before we were talking now, you mentioned framework agreements that right. were in place with the UK, for right. example. Right. Right. Can you reflect on sort of what is it that would make it possible for these funders yeah. to drive money to local organizations in a more efficient way? Yeah, I think, I think uh, that's, um, I mean, there are a number of things. From an organizational, uh, I mean, yeah, from the funder's perspective, um, I think the common argument is that risk, I'm um, de-risking mm -hmm. us by, by funding bigger organizations or international organizations. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, as my colleague would say, that it's not necessarily that you, you actually have created a bar so high uh, for reporting and other sort of uh, requirements that it's almost impossible for us uh, smaller organizations to meet that requirement. Mm -hmm. So, so let's look at whether you need it in the first place, mm -hmm. and let's look at reforming that a little bit mm -hmm. so to make it more equitable for mm -hmm. smaller organizations. Yeah. The second thing is that you know, you you also you, you would only do that once you actually see the value of doing that. So you would really have to be invested in the value of what local organizations bring in. Mm -hmm. They are, they are bringing, um, I think, to a large extent, and if you generate, to bring longer lasting solutions, mm -hmm. locally led solutions, and in the event that um, money dries up, or international organizations have to leave, they're the one who's gonna stay with the community. Mm -hmm. So, so that long lasting relationship is very important, so seeing the value. The third that you would be saying, in cases where you, you built in the confidence, then you actually fund the organization Mm -hmm. uh, rather than a particular initiative. And then uh, with the UK government, and now after the UK government has, has left, we have a strategic partnership with the Canadian government and the Australian government where they fund our strategy. Mm -hmm. So we have a five-year strategy. We say that we are going to do X, Y, Z based on needs in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And also we are going to do X, Y, Z in our organizational development. So that means whether it's leadership, training, building systems in place, and technology we are investing quite heavily on. So all of those are very, very important. And the fact that the last 10 years we had that core agreement that with, with uh, UK and the other partners, that really helped us to now think big, go big on global, uh, and, and build those capacities. So, so uh, and in, recently we are seeing some shift in terms of not only bilaterals, but you know, some high net worth individuals are coming in who are saying some of these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Barack Bangladesh, for example, recently was part of the list of uh, McKinsey Scott, who is um, mm -hmm. kind of changing, in a way, the face of philanthropy, in a way. Uh, but, you know, when I asked my first conversation with them, they was like, what do I have to do? I mean, the answer was very simple, that you just have to give a one-page report for three years in terms of what you're going to, what did you do? <laughs> and the important thing is that, you know, this doesn't have a time limit. So if you think you're going to take five years, take five years, ten years, and it's going to be entirely driven by your needs. So it's that the confidence on the organization, and that, that speaks a lot. And I think, I think that's where we need, to, we need to shift. Well, congratulations, because that's a huge accomplishment, and I'm glad that your organization was on her radar. Um, I do want to ask the audience, I forgot to mention this, to please uh, tweet your questions and comments to at Twitter, at CGDEV, with the, or you could do the hashtag CGDTalks, or send us an email at events at CGDEV.org, or even below the YouTube. Um, so we'll, we'll look uh, on our feed for questions coming soon. Let me ask you um, a question. So when we think about 
you know, are there other BRAC out there? As you, mm. as you say, you have this, you started in Bangladesh and you've expanded to other countries. Are those independent entities in other countries or are they subsidiaries? That's one question. Mm -hmm. Like, do they count as local organizations or not? That's a question. Well, yeah. Okay, go ahead. We'll no, I mean, it mean, depend, depends on the yeah. definition. But yeah. I mean, I, I, again, the expansion model has always, there's a, a nationally registered organization, yeah. but uh, they're part of a bigger, we have a BRAC International, mm -hmm. uh, but the individual entities are registered within the national mm -hmm. sphere. Um, um, but I mean, also from an ethos perspective, again, the, the idea has always been that it's going to be fully nationalized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, initially, a lot we had a lot more Bangladeshi staff who, who went there, but mm -hmm. there is that element of south to south transfer, mm -hmm. but then over time as well, that kind of building the local national capacity has been a, has a big, big focus for all our international operations. And now mm -hmm. we have kind of branched out as well and created a model, a technical assistance model mm -hmm. for the ultra poor graduation, where we're working with the governments and also larger organizations who want to take the learning from that and include that in their social protection interventions. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there are the different elements that are being created. And again, and in the humanitarian space, we have, again, I don't know whether it's going to be successful or not, but we have started a new mechanism to answer some of the issues that the donors raise, mm -hmm. why, why they don't fund local organizations. So we started a local pooled fund, mm -hmm. a pooled fund for localization, essentially, mm -hmm. to only fund local organizations, but we have created a uh, space where it's not just a fund allocation, we are not mm -hmm. just managing the fund, but we're going to do an assessment of the organizations who become eligible uh, to get the fund and their mm -hmm. organizational capabilities, right? And then paired them up with capacity building, whether it's safeguarding, reporting, whatnot. So they will also get that capacity enhancement support. Mm -hmm. Along with the fund, they're going to get to do the activities that there is going to be a separate pot altogether. So that in two, two to three years' time, they can directly compete and donors can, cannot say that oh, they're too risky. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think the solutions are out there. So what I, what I was saying is that you have to uh, really invest and you have to appreciate the value that the local organizations actually bring in. So that is missing right now, very much missing. We have, we're seeing a lot of lip service, but not putting all the sort of eggs in, in, in line. There's a little bit of the fear factor there because, yeah. you know, as aid agencies have been cutting headcount right. alongside their budgets, so, you know, maybe one person sitting in a country office oversees already 30 grants, right. and then we'd be saying to them, add another 15. Right. And so I think that's why they think about these I like the idea of a pooled fund right. where there's coaching alongside. Right. So maybe right. that that is more doable as well. Yeah. Um, and you know, the other thing is, it's it, everything's great until something goes wrong. Yeah. Right? And then you know, everyone's uh, worried about that because right. uh, they're they're very high. It's not that there's a high risk because usually the amount of money that is misplaced or whatever misused is so small. Mm -hmm. But it's that it has these sort of knock-on reputational effects that are that then instead of learning from it and sort of correcting the fact right. that you found out about it is already probably a really good thing. Um, but isn't there also a bit of oversensitivity when it comes absolutely. to these things? I mean, I mean, we expect that the rest of the world operates in a certain way. Of course, there are crooks. Of mm -hmm. course, there are bad incidents happen. But yeah. why development sector always is think that everything is happening in a pedestal in a very different way, right? So that in one sort of scandal, everybody's sort of changing exactly. everything in the way we I mean, it. I always say well, we, the, the Commission on Medicaid and Medicare Services in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, the size of the fraud per year can be 30 to 40 billion right. detected right. each year. Wow. But that's a really small share of the total spending, right? And then they know, okay, well, there's some bad actors. We're not going to give more contracts to them. Exactly. And you know, But it's goes without mention sometimes. Absolutely. And then meanwhile, one incident with $20,000 right. can be catastrophic right. in the global development field. It, it's hard. Um, uh, let me ask you, let me just check if there are any questions. Can I ask you also yeah. about BRAC's role vis-a-vis -vis government? You talked about a model where, yeah. okay, they weren't providing education, we stepped in, now government is ready to provide, we step out. Right. Is it always so easy? Are there times when you feel you're running a parallel system tell tell us about that no we we hear that quite a bit but i don't i don't think that's that's essentially the case because i mean i think the the as i was saying that you know scale was necessary and we always had that 
idea that education really cannot wait mm -hmm. until we get uh, the, I mean, the idea was that government needs to get their act together uh, because if you're stepping in, then government will never get their act together. That is not the case. Uh, but, but if we did not step in, we would have lost a few generations of children who would be out of school and who would never get that chance. So we didn't wait. We had that urgency that we, need, we have the model. We, we can get mobilize the resource. We can scale. So we went with that, and and as 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 the government is uh, sort of make creating more schools, the focus is moving into quality and not access. So we are reducing. We have reduced ours. Uh, so it is. I think as long as you have the rigor and the attention that it's not about your uh, self preservation, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 there is no shortage of. Uh, challenges in this world, right? I mean, I think it's the approach, right? So, 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 what our founder used to say: you have to stay relevant or, or perish. I think that's a very uh, important motto for us. Mm -hmm. uh, that then we look into the emerging challenges. So, it's it, in a way, it's no different than a say uh, an R and D lab of a say private sector company who are. Looking at what are the gaps, uh, where are the where are you can you can you can create a demand and and so we are looking at just the different types of gaps, you know, social gaps, you know, and then that's where we can play a role, and I think that entrepreneurial nature in social services mm -hmm. is also what made BRAC quite unique because I mean a lot of for example um, uh, initiatives have become large social enterprises for us mm -hmm. uh, are generating huge surpluses which is coming back to the pot. To make us independent financially, more self-sufficient, uh, self, uh, self mm -hmm. uh, giving us the liberty to invest in areas we can, mm -hmm. focus in the problems we can. So that's also, I think, a lesson for also other organizations to build that financial capability on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what Bragg did in the past has been that rather than looking at the base of the pyramid as consumers, like. Mm -hmm many of the other multinationals have done, we have looked at them as producers. Mm -hmm. So we have built their capacity to produce products which BRAC could sell elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So then they, just, they generated income, they had livelihood opportunity, mm -hmm. but then over time also with the scale, this became profitable uh, for, for us as well, which we can channel back to other development work. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bangladesh is also kind of a growth success yeah. story. It's, yeah. it's exceptional, and when you compare Bangladesh to neighbors, we right. won't name them. How you know maybe Black BRAC played a role in that? Did those neighbors have a BRAC like organization? I don't know. No, um, I mean but, say yeah. say I mean our largest neighbor didn't have a national organization yeah. uh, um, like mm -hmm. across. They have a more state like uh, mm -hmm. state level organization. And and essentially, when I asked and we we interact with the civil society over there, I mean the government regulations did not let them create a national organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, one of former BRAC staff who went to India and started mm -hmm. a bank mm -hmm. called Bantan, which is now nationally scaled. Uh, but, but that, I think, is an important element because government in Bangladesh, successive governments over time, actually gave not-for-profit a lot of space to mm -hmm. operate. So I think at the end of the day, they think, thought that we are constrained. If we let them work, end of the day, we look good, so why not? Right. So, this is, it, I think that's a really important yeah. point. And you know, also even when you think about, you know, governments contracting non-governmental organizations to provide certain mm -hmm. kinds of services, and that's maybe controversial for other reasons. But many times governments feel like that it's a zero-sum game or something like right. that, right. Um, and right. that it's the monopoly of the state and no one else can be here. Right. Um, right. But you you really sort of carved out a role for right. so a lot of a lot of the innovation, social innovations, actually came from the not-for-profit, whether it's microfinance, the one-room school model, ultra-poor graduation. So I think, I think in, in the state system or the government systems, I mean, it's not really known for innovation, right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but I think essentially if we can take the best of both, that kind of use government infrastructures, mm -hmm. uh, and this is where we are trying to reposition ourselves in Bangladesh. Our government has become more stronger, more capacity has been mm -hmm. built. Uh, funding is shrinking. So how do we system? Uh, how do we strength, strengthen existing system? Mm -hmm. So what we cannot uh, allocate money for is uh, building infrastructure. Where government is building lots of these vocational training centers for young people, 
which is great because but but can we play on the software bit can we work on the training the module the linkage with the private sector making the skills very relevant uh, with the needs of the employment employability skills so that that complementarity if we can get that to work i think that's the future of collaboration in a country where government have strengthened you don't need scale and system gets strengthened over time as well. So kind of wrap around supportive yeah, interventions. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, what about kind of accountability for government? So do you have a role in that space or are you mainly focused on kind of service delivery, these interventions that right. generate development benefits? Um, we, we stay away from it, I mean, mm -hmm. frankly speaking. I, I think in a sense uh, we have to work with governments across very different layers. Mm -hmm. We are very large, but there are other actors in the civil society uh, which plays that role. Mm -hmm. So we have very consciously uh, curved that space mm -hmm. that uh, it's, it's not just service delivery, but essentially important areas. They, for example, in our legal aid program is, is the largest legal aid program in the country. But, you know, that... Uh, I mean, their issues, the petty corruption, the women fighting over her land, does not get talked about in the broader human rights space. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that's a problem because I think, you know, human rights is not just about civil liberty as defined by mm -hmm. Western countries. It's about your day-to-day -day existence mm -hmm. as well. I know we're getting your, the service that you deserve. Uh, so how do we elevate that? So we focus, our role is more around that rather than um, getting into governance issues and other things. So, so okay. but, nice. but we, we try to kind of elevate the voice by, by being on the ground so people can mobilize. So for example, in one of our program called Community Mobilization, mm -hmm. uh, Community Empowerment Program, where women have mobilized and they have run in local elections, local union council elections, and they got elected. Mm -hmm. so, so, so again, we play the role of the catalyst, but then they actually, the voice comes from the people themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. I think sometimes in conversations uh, among donors, when there's a lot of talk about NGOs playing this kind of watchdog or accountability role. Um, but, you know, if you're a service delivery NGO or you're working alongside government to deliver an effective service, that's very difficult and, and maybe yeah. not even constructive. Yeah. And so it's probably the role of other kinds of entities. Um, let me go to our in-house audience that's here. Uh, we'll go to you, Charles. Uh, Eleni is coming to you with a microphone. Thanks very much. This is fascinating. Um, can I ask you to imagine uh, you are the international assistance god, um, and you can decide for Bangladesh to start off with, um, sort of what percentage of total international assistance goes to governments, what goes to directly to the private sector to provide services, or whatever, uh, what, what proportion goes to NGOs? So how, and, and what proportion goes to uh, outside <laughs> consulting right. and other groups? Right. Um, yeah. how, how would you sort of divide it up? Um, it depends uh, donor to donor. So, so for USAID, for example, majority goes to contractors. Oh, what, what would I like? Okay, yeah. You, you, you're, directing, you're directing it all. You get to yeah. choose. Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is a very, very good question. I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly speaking, I think as I was mentioning that this collaboration, uh, you cannot give all the money to NGOs because, you know, end of the day uh, is the government which is accountable for delivering. They have to face the election every five years. We don't, right? So we have our own accountability mechanism, but I think this is not healthy. But so, so I think it's a healthy balance between government and local actors is very, very important. But then I think the donors, what, what happens is that I think that, that one level of advocacy is needed with the government. Because increasingly, when you see that the, the trend across the world that we are seeing, that is, you know, the governments are becoming more stronger with the donor dependency going down. They care less and less about um, um, what they're saying. Uh, so if that's the case, if you don't have any leverage with the government, then it makes sense to see how where the money goes the longer walk, right? I think essentially going back to that space that 
you, you cannot just give money on a project by project, three year, five year, going the giving the money to a contractor, then project finished, we wash our hands off, move on to the next big innovation, whatever that is. So, so essentially, longer term, bring in more rigor into what's working, what's not working. Uh, so, so all of that comes together, and the best let the best best uh, provider win. <laughs> <laughs> let the best provider win. Okay, one more question, then you can go ahead. Uh, Anik Hi. Mukherjee from Center for Global Development, a policy fellow here. I'm a big big admirer of BRAC. Um, been in Dhaka slums with the Manoshi program and oh, okay. seen the amazing work that that you do. And I'm come from India, so okay. always envious. And you're um, Bengali as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Two questions. One, to pick up a little bit on the government um, aspect. Um, this political tension between NGOs and governments, and we see it playing out in many different ways, What? how do you mitigate the frictions? You mentioned that you don't get into the accountability space, as Amanda said, yeah. but can you always stay away? Because, first of all, your size and your impact and your name recognition. So how does that, how do you balance that? And that's a question not only for Bangladesh, but for many other countries, including India. The second question is, uh, when we had the conversation with the, the field level staff, it was really amazing how your values have been really drilled down to the last person who's going around the mm. field and, mm. and, and taking that um, responsibility. And they also said that you ha they had a, a, a sort of a idea that this is not going to be always that you will provide free service. Mm. So they, you will transition people into more sustainable right. kind of a business model. Right. Now, Bangladesh, you've done it amazingly. And you work in different other countries. Has that model been kind of used other places where you transition people out and move them up the ladder mm. as you have done in Bangladesh? So two questions. Two questions. Sorry, it's uh, a bit no, long. No, thank you. Great questions. Let me ask the first one. Uh, I think, you know, you, in the we just celebrated 50 years of BRAC last month. And and it was the last, so Bangladesh's growth and BRAC's growth is kind of has become very uh, synonymous. But, but what essentially you are only starting to hear about BRAC is that we are talking more about ourselves, our work more and more. For the first 40 odd years, the organization actually kept a very, very low profile. And that was the founder for a deliberate reason because the whole idea that the government should never think that you're out there for the glory. Mm -hmm. They should not look at you as a political threat. Mm -hmm. So whichever government that is. And I think that's where sometimes uh, the tension comes from. So if that element of trust comes in that mm -hmm. they're doing it just for the impact and they're not going to come in and run for election and they're going to not yeah. get the credit, I think government is fine. I think at the end of the day, that trust is there. And, and, and we see in a very different tiers of government. Well, starting from that agriculture officer to this most senior secretary, there is that level of respect that uh, that we 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 do work, and we are here. We're for the long term, and we're not going anywhere. Uh, so I think that's a key factor. I think that's from that 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 trust is there, and the second element on whether this is channeling. I think the it's uh, there are two reflections. One is that we we went international in countries which are very very difficult post-conflict countries, where systems are not there, very fragile fragile states. And uh, so I think the jury is uh, still out there. Uh, I think it's going to take a much longer uh, time. And, and we are OK with that, because I mean, we want to have a very longer term presence mm -hmm. over time. Uh, but of course, I mean, the Bangladeshi organization being in Bangladesh has its separate mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, uh, benefits. But what uh, but, uh, Anik, mm -hmm. Anik has tell, said about that the softer element of uh, the culture of the organization, DNA, uh, the focus, human-centric focus, um, if that's something we are really trying to harness across wherever we are. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is the ultimate thing that makes us unique, our commitment of our field staff, how they deliver, how the relationship they have they're built in. Uh, with the program participants, it's such a unique part, and the culture mm -hmm. so for the organization. So, if we, now there's a generational shift happening within the organization, and then if you ask me what keeps you up, 
-hmm. late at night. That's one thing. Can we maintain this culture? Mm -hmm. Can we keep the leadership pipeline who understands this ethos and philosophy mm -hmm. of development? And, and can we channel that across in different parts of the world as well? So. so. Well, a lot of work ahead. As you yeah. said, there are plenty of problems to go around, yes. and I'm really glad that BRAC is there. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for coming to visit Thank the Center you. for Global Development. We'll continue to examine this question of uh, local organizations and, and aid and, and ways that that could become more efficient, and we'll keep our eyes on <laughs> the donors uh, on your behalf. And get so. the rigor. Uh, as Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to the audience for joining. Thank you.